Ladies right. and gentlemen, we've uh, Question. Questions. Uh, heard the questions are being pulled there. I will ask you the question, Dr. Kurt, and uh, I will start with Dr. Richard Roberts, who uh, uh, really uh, gave us uh, a genomic perspective. And I'd like to ask, you know, I, uh, I was always, when I was young, hearing about how we would end up having uh, over 100,000 genes, and then uh, we ended up uh, with, uh, a year later, 30,000 genes and 20,000 genes, and yet uh, we have uh, a million proteins, so the idea of direct encoding, how, how is it? that with such few genes, such a complex organism as ourselves can exist? Do we understand that today? Or do we speculate on how this is happening if the central dogma is not necessarily there? Well, we certainly don't understand it, but we can always speculate. So one of the things that we do know is that for any given gene, and if we think of a gene as being a stretch of DNA from the point where transcription starts to where it ends, there is a lot of RNA splicing that takes place and there is a lot of alternative splicing in which different bits of the genes get mixed. And so from one gene you can often make many, many proteins. And even after we first discovered splicing, everybody was speculating, well, there must be alternative splicing. It's really only in the last two or three years that we've realized just how much of that is going on and that there is a lot of alternative splicing that is going on. So that allows you to make many, many more gene products. You also have to recognize there is a lot of post-translational modification that takes place. So for instance, when you think about, say, histones, there are many, many places on even a short histone protein where there is modification, phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, and so on. And so this also gives rise to essentially different, different proteins in that they will have different properties depending upon how they become post-translationally modified. Well, well I you, think yes. I should say something here. Please, yes, On no. the level of the DNA, we do, of course, not see the post-translational modifications. But the reason why we have millions, and there was talk about 30,000 or 100,000 before, is that those 30,000 or 100,000 were a guess by Wally Gilbert, uh, executed on the back of, a, of an envelope, a volatile envelope. And then it became a classic, without there being any work. And this was only for the human. But now, when we talk about millions, then we are talking about human, mouse, uh, many other uh, higher organisms and hundreds and hundreds of bacteria and we just add this up. Otherwise you cannot understand why it is such a large number. I hope you agree with this. Well, I mean, you know, there are two separate numbers. So there's the number of proteins that are present in a human cell, yes. of which there are many more than there are genes because of alternative splicing. When Kurt was talking on his slides about 8 million proteins, I mean, he's talking about all of the proteins that we know about in all the organisms we know about, but then, you know, we only know a tiny fraction of the organisms on Earth. Um, we probably sample less than one-tenth of one percent of the bacteria, for instance. So we're, um, our ignorance is pretty great. Well, uh, but the... the uh direction then that we should go for uh, ensuring that this is not another guess, but uh, a real direction. How can we validate that it is indeed these uh, uh, transcriptions that we can get the control that uh, you're, you're saying is, is happening to get the number of proteins out of that limited number of genes? Right, well, so people are looking at individual genes to try to understand how alternative splicing is working. And there have been a number of studies recently, some not published yet, that show that the amount of this alternative splicing is just way, way greater than we had ever thought. And it's, it's kind of exciting in and many ways. And still exquisitely controlled. Pardon? And still exquisitely controlled. Oh, 
when you get to control, now you're talking about the real complexity of the human yes, genome. Right. Yes, and that's, I suppose, the future Nobel Prize for the person who hey. finds that mechanism. I think, you know, the nice thing about biology is we know so little that there is lots of room for Nobel Prizes. Maybe some of you in the audience. Indeed. Well, I, I would then that turn to Dr. Wirtlich and I'll ask him a, a, a question on a more general topic, which is fundamentally, if uh, you know the structure of the mechanism, pieces of a mechanism, um, one can infer how the mechanism works, but uh, uh, it's not really the same if I have a uh, a watch and I have just the pieces of the watch, I may not necessarily know how all those uh, pieces work together. And we are now still discovering how the pieces are working together. Uh, if, uh, you know, one has uh, several additional lifetimes of study, how would you go about trying to understand how the whole system works? Would you still go by the pieces or is there some way in which you could approach the system in its entirety? Well, this is the way structural biology moves these days. That's why electron microscopy is gaining more and more momentum. Optical microscopy is gaining more and more momentum because right now we are in a phase where we supplement high resolution structures of individual molecules and limited size complexes of multiple molecules with low resolution pictures of what we can see in the intact cell or similar. That's, exactly, that's, that's what's going to happen during the next 20 years. You'll get more and more, it must go that way because it, it's clear we are now reaching the limit of what we can understand when we look at individual molecules. But I think we will always have to go back with these low resolution maps. We will detect interesting, apparently interesting features and we will go back and then try to get high resolution structures for these parts of the overall picture. Well, I may uh, ask then to Dr. Warren on this because, uh, uh, you know, one of the, the, the issues uh, that you had, of course, was uh, uh, to get something accepted by uh, the medical establishment that was not the, the general, general view. Uh, whereas one hears from the most distinguished scientists how little we know, how uncertain we are, how open we are to interpretation. So first, why was it so hard uh, for that recognition to come about? And then secondly, what would your uh, recommendation uh, be based on your experience or the lessons it be if you are challenging an established position? Why is it not as in our romanticized view of perfect science automatically accepted because the evidence is there and therefore everybody accepts? Um, I think that's a very difficult question. Um, for me, um, we were trying to uh, show that bacteria that no one, that everybody knew didn't exist were the cause of the disease that everybody knew was caused by something else. And there were sort of two well-known facts. Ulcers were caused by stress, alcohol, spices and things like that. And bacteria didn't grow in the stomach. So I was trying to show that bacteria that, that weren't there were trying to cause a disease that everyone knew was some, caused by something else. Um, and that took some doing. I mean, we were really trying to uh, negate two well-held views, one on top of the other. Uh, not just one view, but two views that were strongly held. Um, now, I'm... I'm a little bit surprised, I, I was a little bit surprised at the time when I showed people pictures with those bacteria, that I sh you know, like I showed you, but I had plenty of more, and half of them just simply didn't believe they were there. I, mean, I, that, I just couldn't understand that. But apart from that, I think 
you have to remember the the medical world is um, fairly uh, um, well they're against change, sudden change which I think in many ways is fair enough because doctors have to deal with patients, they have to look after their patients they don't do things because some funny pathologist down there says that bacteria are causing something when they know bacteria don't exist so you have to prove it and that took some doing um, and one of the, the things I found most extraordinary really was that after we published our definitive paper there was apparently a worldwide disbelief and what happened over the next two years was that there were several hundred papers many of them which did exactly the same research work we did and were apparently undertaken by people who were trying to prove that we were wrong and they all got the same results we did but in spite of that the medical establishment still didn't believe it and it took another seven years or so before they had a major international meeting that decided that we were actually correct. Yes. Yeah, I, I remember that it was uh, quite a, a lengthy and difficult process and I think the Lancet delayed uh, uh, and, and a number of other issues of that kind. And that really brings me to Peter Agri because you mentioned something important. You mentioned uh, using the bully pulpit and uh, uh, speaking out on, on a number of issues. Uh, well, uh, some of us, uh, I've even had TV programs uh, in which I've explained to the general public about the theory of evolution and uh, Darwin and the like. Uh, some of us are still struck by the fact that in the United States, the country is so admired for its enormous scientific uh, achievements and scientific advance public attitudes uh, and the advance of uh, alternative views uh, from uh, creation to intelligent design to uh, outright uh, rejection continues uh, after 150 years from the origin of species, or 151 years from the origin of species. What do you feel that people like yourself need to do in the United States, not only in other countries of the world, to bring about that greater acceptance of evidentiary approaches, of rationality, of the, the advancement of science by uh, new discoveries? Well, uh, the, the so-called bully pulpit, this, this concept emerged with Teddy Roosevelt, who was president and had great ability to communicate with the public. But you can only communicate when people are listening. <coughs> And so you raise the issue of our, our, our ongoing debate in the United States of evolution, something that the, our, our most religious conservatives feel is, is heresy because it disagrees with the, the scripture. And uh, I, I think to take that head on is probably a mistake. Uh, no matter what you say, they won't believe it. Uh, just as there are people who still believe the earth is flat, there's a flat earth society. You could join it if you wanted. You probably wouldn't want to. So I, I think the, the, the issue as scientists is to provide reasonable information. And if these individuals who refuse to believe in evolution uh, drive the speed limit and pay their taxes, they can believe what they want. But it's important they understand the concept of natural selection, which is the basis of evolution. Because when their children or grandchildren have bacterial infections, if they take them to some uh, non-scientifically trained medical practitioner they treat with the wrong antibiotic, the children could die. So I think we have to pick our fights very carefully. Natural selection is important. Whether the term evolution is used or not, it's, it's more often a, a, an argument that you, you, you can't convince some people, so I, I stay, stay away from that. Yeah, well, I think there is a much simpler answer for the young kids here in the audience. If you meet resistance with the results that you have found, you can almost be sure that it is either completely wrong or it's something important. Don't forget that Einstein did not get the Nobel Prize for the Relativity Theory because he wasn't believed. Right? When Ernst and myself published the first two-dimensional structure of an NMR structure of a protein, the paper was rejected and the reviewer was proud to sign, so we know who signed. 
And it says this may be intellectually stimulating, but certainly will never have any impact in biochemistry. So it shouldn't be published here. <laughs> so, and I, could, I could tell you other examples uh, of this sort. Yeah. So th that's an important message to the young students. If you have troubles getting your ideas through, there may be something important behind it. Yeah, I mean, that's but, more or less what... Or they may be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's still the possibility of error. I mean, we're... Yeah. Yes, sir. With the water. Well, I, I think that the same thing applied to my work. Uh, it was something new, so people didn't believe it. If you really want to get a Nobel Prize, you've got to have something new. And new things are hard to, to, to uh, make anyone believe. But what you've got to do is stick with it. If you believe what you've got, just stay with it, get more and more proof that you're right until they can't disbelieve you. But what made me uh, always wonder why, uh, uh, let's say, natural selection, to not get into the world of evolution, which implies a particular tra trajectory upwards, the, the, we've been uh, breeding plants and animals ever since societies existed. We've been selecting on traits successive generations. I mean, the entire history of farming is based on that. So why is that overarching theory that's so central to biology so difficult to get uh, uh, the public to accept when everything before us, uh, from uh, breeding horses to breeding dogs for show, <laughs> to breeding plants that produce more food, to, to cows that produce more milk, has been done basically by selecting for traits in successive generations. Well, Ismail, you're approaching this very logically. And if the individuals had the information and they considered it, they would realize you're correct. But you're dealing with a population of people, when they hear evolution, they immediately reject it and say, I ain't descended from no monkey. Yes. That's the issue. My grandfather was not a monkey. It's not a matter of natural selection. I have and and the, Af <laughs> the United States is a rich country, but half of our people did not read a single book last year. Half of our people believe cavemen and dinosaurs coexisted because they saw it on the Flintstones. So, we, we, could, we could go on and on about what the people believe. That's, that's GM's true. not natural. They believe things have, I mean, the ordinary breeding is, is natural. GM's not. Uh, or yes, well, that's, that's what they say. Somebody also said that they wanted their potatoes without any genes in them, so I, <laughs> I, I heard that as well. Uh, but uh, Eric Baskin, I, uh, you know, just slightly shifting ground here, but uh, I think it's, it's very important. Um, sure, you did explain, of course, why we provide uh, uh, patents when you compensate innovators, and after all, it's in, in Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution and so on. Uh, but fundamentally, Fundamentally, uh, many of us, as we look at the world, are very concerned, both from the question of access to food to uh, the question of access to medicine. And uh, we are convinced, uh, many of us, that differential pricing, products that could be sold at different prices in different markets, would make a lot of sense. And yet, uh, a lot of the private companies have difficulty with that and are worried that somehow uh, the, the, if you allow genetics to coexist with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the uh, officially uh, sanctioned, for example, uh, medicines, that it would undermine the market, even though geographic division of markets is well known, established, and the shape of the product could be different. Why is there such resistance to something that would increase the market, get more benefit to more people around the world, and recognize the reality that uh, you will not get somebody uh, in Nepal or in, 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 in South Africa to pay uh, $1,500 medicine? They simply can't afford it. Well, I think fortunately uh, the answer is that uh, that these drug companies are coming around to the idea that it's not only good for the world, but it can be good for them too. It, it, it's taken uh, a distressingly long time, but uh, you, you now see uh, 
a wide variety of drugs that were previously not available at differential prices uh, being uh, priced in, in a more affordable way. Uh, perhaps even more important, we're now seeing the, uh, the development of new drugs, uh, drugs which are specifically geared to poorer populations being developed through what I would call uh, assisted market devices. So, so the, the World Bank uh, last year introduced a, an incentive program uh, for encouraging drug companies to develop vaccines uh, for drugs specific to equatorial Africa. Uh, th these are drugs against, uh, vaccines against uh, pneumococcal disease. Uh, the, these vaccines would not have been developed, left to the market alone, because uh, the demand isn't there. Isn't that, at, at least not at a, at, an, at a price which would induce the, the companies to, to develop these vaccines. They, the, the, uh, the clientele are too poor to pay a, uh, a remunerative uh, price. But what the World Bank has done is to, is to work out a, a clever uh, assistance program so that donors kick in a bit extra. And as these vaccines get developed, uh, they will get some of the extra money that the, that the donors have kicked in. But uh, in, in economic parlance, and I speak, of course, as someone who just has a 28-year career in the World Bank, uh, the question of differential pricing, which I obviously favor, and so do you in what you said, uh, is seen by some as absolutely requiring market fixing between the companies, and that this is against the operation of a free market, against competition, and would lead to uh, oligopolistic uh, uh, combines uh, between the companies to agree on, uh, on that. Uh, some of us argue that competition is still possible, uh, but what do you say uh, to that critique? Because it's very important for us in Egypt. The price of medicine, for example, uh, imported medicines is way beyond the reach of uh, uh, the average Egyptian citizen. So, especially given the exchange rates. Well, I, I, uh, I don't think you can convincingly make the argument that differential pricing is going to lead to, uh, to, to concentration of power. Actually, quite, quite the opposite. Differential pricing will make possible the coexistence of, of companies uh, which cater to low-income clientele. But one of the great success stories of our time has been the, uh, the development in, in India of drug companies which produce generic drugs at much lower prices uh, that have successfully uh, served many patients who otherwise wouldn't have been uh, served. There, there's no evidence to suggest that, uh, that these new companies have driven any others out of business. I will remember that because day after tomorrow we have a, a similar panel with uh, chief executive officers, <laughs> CEOs of companies, and I will tell them, hey, Master said, <laughs> you have no fear well, you of don't, doing that. You don't have to take my word for it. There's, plenty, there's plenty of uh, evidence out there. Uh, but I would like to derive your authority. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I could make a comment here. Perhaps healthcare is not something that should be a part of the normal market system. So one can make a case, I think, that there are certain things that go on within society that are sufficiently important to everybody, not just to the very rich. And the way in which we've done health care in the developed world has been to make it into a commodity that serves the very rich with no concern to those who are not that rich. 
And perhaps the market system isn't the right way to deal with that. Well, when you say the, the developed world, when, when you say the developed world, uh, you, you meant the United States. Because well, no, I think the same is true in the UK and in much of Europe. Well, in, in, in uh, much of Europe, uh, there's universal health care. And, and although it's st it still may be true that the rich can get, uh, by going private, can get uh, somewhat better care than the average citizen, the average citizen still is guaranteed a, a, a pretty reasonable level. Uh, now, I, I was thinking specifically about pharmaceutical products as opposed to the entire health system. Well, in, that's in, a separate in, argument, and I would be glad to, um, to get involved in that. But I, just, just the fact the market system, you know, as practiced in the U.S., has not served us very well if you look at what's happened in the last couple of years. Yeah. Well, I mean, perhaps you could elaborate a bit. Uh, the, the well, no, I'm not the economist. All I, all I can see is that the, <laughs> the value of my, my stocks and the value of um, yeah. the, com the country's wealth has gone way, way yeah. down, and it's had a dramatic effect on the rest of the world. Oh, I, so you're referring to the, to the financial crisis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. But that's maybe beyond where, well, no. where I, Ismail wants to I mean, there, there, there is, there is, a, uh, there is a, a parallel. Uh, I mean, you, you uh, suggest that, that medical care is too important to be, to, to be left to the market alone. Yes. And there's a sense in which finance is too important to be left to well, the market alone. Uh, for the following reason. Ne neither markets, health or finance, is entirely self-regulating. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, although I think both are well served by, by some market elements, I mean, comp competition can be a useful thing in health care as it is in finance. Uh, so both, uh, both kinds of commodities, financial and health, uh, benefits from market elements, but neither uh, should be left to the market alone. And, and the big mistake when it came to finance was, was the belief that we could uh, leave financial markets to their own devices. Uh, yeah, it was also one of those uh, rare instances where uh, I'm a great supporter of innovation, from art to science to practically everything, except in accounting. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, there's been too much creative accounting and uh, invention of new uh, instruments where they are extremely complex to follow the underlying values with them. But the, the bottom line is that for the first time, as I was saying in my earlier remarks today, we have a situation where we can discuss what should be the role of government, what should be the role of, uh, of uh, the private sector, and, and what is the role of regulation in ensuring that markets function. Because, uh, I mean, in my life earlier before coming to Egypt, I was always fighting along with Joe Stiglitz and others that this uh, obsessive view of just free, totally free markets is wrong. What we want are competitive markets, and that requires a state, it requires a legal system, it requires a, a, a structure behind it. Now, for science, however, we I want a, to advance innovation. So how I do you advance innovation? I Go have ahead. a question to the proceedings here, procedures. When do we get questions from the audience? I have them here. Okay. Ah. I'm reading from them. <laughs> I'm reading from them. Is, is he asking your questions? Very, uh, <laughs> excuse me, these are very short. Mm. Uh, the what, the These are very short questions. I haven't heard one of those yet. You haven't heard what? I have not heard a short, clean question yet. That will come from the audience. Well, these, these are questions from the audience. They are passed on to the three gentlemen okay. behind okay. you, who uh, Professor uh, Salah Suleiman, uh, Dr. Yes. Yes. Nabla, yes. and yes. Dr. Let's Muhammad hear Baham some. Let's hear some. We have been hearing some. Yeah. 
<laughs> Some of the questions I've been giving you are questions that have come from the audience. Okay. Right. Here's another Three one. Three likes. Uh, somebody is asking, this is a more specific one, uh, how can undergraduates, postgraduates in the area here take part of Comrex? Okay, so that, that looks as though it's for me. Yes, it's for you. But <coughs> in, uh, that one is very specific. Yeah. I picked on the right. larger ones and uh, I launched them with things for you. But they are all questions from the audience. Okay. So I think within a month or so, there will be a website up connected with Combrex. Um, if you want to find out more about it and when it comes up, you can go to my the website that I run, it's a database about restriction enzymes called Rebase, R-E-B-A-S-E. -E. If you Google that, as soon as Combrex goes live, there will be a direct link to it on that page. Or you can email me. The email address you can find very easily if you just Google Richard Roberts Nobel you will find as much contact information for me as you need. I don't hide my email address. And we were now on the, uh, uh, this other question here, which is how would you improve creating more innovation, improve education, improve uh, research support systems to create more innovation in science? It's again, it's a question from the floor. You want to take it? Do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. I, yes. I mean, coming this question coming from this audience is quite has to be treated with a grain of salt, because it will be very difficult to support truly basic research in an area like Egypt at this moment. There has to be some outlook to uh, rapid returns. And so I suppose that there is a lot of possibility here to come up with really original, innovative solutions in applied research that will, and that's what we all want in the end, help to improve the quality of life of those who live here. Well, that's well committed for Eric. I think, I think because I promised that we would be concluding around 7.15. So I would uh, uh, like to uh, go uh, for a round of comments from uh, uh, each of you. And uh, perhaps I could start with Eric. What would be the take home message at the end of the day that you would like to give this audience to take? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about the take-home message, but I, uh, on, yes. the, on the issue of, of how to encourage more, more innovation, uh, I mean, a, as an economist, I, I, I find that there's a lot of evidence that people respond to incentives, that, that, that one way to get people to do anything is to give them an incentive to do it. Uh, in the case of innovation, uh, one, one area in which we've been saying for years that we, where we need in innovation is in the realm of what is called uh, green energy or alternative energy. But we have a finite supply of fossil fuels. Uh, they are not only running out, but they are also contributing to, to uh, climate change. Uh, how can we, how can we uh, encourage research in energy which, which doesn't have these shortcomings. Uh, and there is a, a good economic answer to that, which is to uh, create a tax on carbon. A, a very simple device uh, such as uh, creating a, uh, a, a significant carbon tax would uh, almost immediately stimulates uh, an enormous amount of innovation uh, around the world. So we, we, don't, ha we don't have to have uh, a complicated policy. Uh, a, a, a simple economic policy in this case would, 
would go a long way. Simple, economically difficult, politically. Well, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps if people understood yeah. the implications, it wouldn't even be so difficult politically. I agree with you. I agree. Professor what do you do that? Well, <clears throat> I think the most important thing I'd say is that if you've got a good idea, um, don't worry if no one believes you. Just push it and prove it and get more and more evidence for it. Um, because if it's once something like that, as Professor Rutrick said before, it's likely to be something important. If everyone believes it to start with, it probably won't have any significance anyway. Well, sometimes uh, the late Carl Sagan said that uh, the burden of proof is to the extent that you're trying to challenge the existing yeah. order, um, that you have to add a lot more proof to convince you. Yes. Was it and if you're right, you'll probably be able to find it. In the end, probably. Perseverance, perseverance. Insight, imagination, perseverance. What was it about? Well, I would I encourage you to compare the situation today in areas that are not highly developed for pursuing science and what it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you were cut off from what was happening in the world. Today, you have the Internet, you have access to inf more information that you will ever be able to handle. Use this chance. Start with using this worldwide network of information transfer and then think about what you can do here on site that will, first of all, help on site to improve the quality of life as simple as that. Peter. Well, I, I think um, children are inherently very curious and very creative. And these, these are the components that make a great scientist. So we're starting out with little people that have all the makings, and then we sort of see a decline in creative art, interest in science from a textbook as opposed to something with your own hands. So my, my sense is uh, we, we need to foster that. Now, part of being curious is having a, a, an attention deficit. The, the teacher is telling you this is the lesson, but you're seeing something fantastic out the window. And there's, <laughs> there's a trade-off here. You can be punished for having too much deficit <laughs> and, and unless you see something that's really fantastically important. And, and Barry Marshall, Robin Warren did such a thing. And, and just like in Galileo's time, they were sort of punished for this. All of the surgeons realized they would lose money if you could treat ulcers with antibiotics as opposed to surgery. You know, of course, you're against the establishment. So I think, I think some, some curiosity, some attention deficit, and a recognition that most people that play it close to the edge will fail. But, you know, that's not so bad. It's better to try than fail. Than I think if you asked every one of us, did you have more success in your career or more failure, you'd say more failures, but you celebrate the success. Celebrate the success, that's true. Rich. Um, well, you know, it, it's always hard to come up with some little pithy comments in relation to something like this, but one thing that I would have you note is that most of the scientists who won Nobel Prizes did their work before they were 40 years old. And in general, young people are the most innovative and the most creative people that are out there. And one of the mistakes they often make is to read the textbooks and believe everything that's in it and listen to the old folks and believe everything they're told. Be skeptical. If you look at the mess that quite a lot of the world is in, it's because of the old people. It's not because of, of young people like yourselves. If some of you want to go into politics, try not to make the mistakes uh, of the old. I think we've, we've often not done a very good job of helping the young people around here. You're the future. You're the future of this world. And you can make it better if you choose to. But don't always listen to what the old folks tell you. <laughs> well. Big point. Big point. <laughs> Be forceful, creative, advance with uh, commitment, but bring evidence to support your views. That's how science advances. 
And science, the authority of the method of science is still the best thing we have. It has served humanity well. We want to make sure that we advance it by our work here in the next few days. Uh, before we end this, I would like to give you each a souvenir for having uh, been with us and honored us with, this, uh, with your presentations today and uh, to participate in this discussion. So, uh, if I may, Omnia, please.